or TV or whatever, we have some technical difficulties. Uh, I don't know about uh, some of our, our, our guests, uh, some people that, that uh, are visitors from Aberdeen, we're, we're glad to have you and anybody else that might be visiting, so to speak, but uh, uh, he's working on that. We're able to stream one part of what we want to show, but we're, we're having some problems getting it up here on our, and everything's looking like it's working okay now, George. <laughs> kind of means we still got some rough edges to uh, work out. Uh, but y'all can come on in and uh, we'll get started here just as soon as we get the rough edges worked out on our technical difficulties. And uh, that'll give uh, some of you coming in to, uh, to get seated. We get, worked that out. I see some, some people coming in from the front. Uh, Michael, can you go open that front door for them? But you might can catch them before they get away. Too late? Okay. They'll, they'll work their way around. And as soon as I get the uh, word from uh, George or Andy or whoever's up there, you give me the cue, we'll, uh, we'll introduce Brother Bob and get started here. We apologize. Everything went smoothly at uh, 7 o'clock last night. Brother Bob had the first lecture, which was good. I would encourage any of you who have not gone through the museum I'm going to put a plug in for that before we get started. You won't see some of the things. He has some actual pieces that come from Bible time, if you will, artifacts. He has obviously some replicas. There are some things uh, that were from the actual movie, Ben-Hur. Uh, some very interesting things, the museum, that if you haven't seen that, uh, you're going to want to go see it. Just take my word for it. Uh, and uh, so I hope you'll do that maybe after the lecture if you haven't done that yet. But I will say this also while we're getting ready to start. We, we appreciate, you know, sometimes when you have bad weather and you have uh, other things, I'll just say, that distract you, uh, people that make an effort to be here anyway, uh, you are to be congratulated and recognized for doing that because that means you have made an extra effort uh, to be able to do to do that and to be here, we appreciate so much you doing that. And I apologize again for the delay, but uh, you know, things happen like that when you were working with electronics and equipment like this. I don't know about y'all, but uh, uh, as a former school teacher, I taught for many years, 40, and never had to deal with anything like COVID. I see some former and present school teachers and they know what I'm talking about. It's a challenge anyway, but we never had to deal with anything like COVID. It, it's just, you know, uh, I've got a daughter-in-law that's still teaching and I tell her pretty frequently, her name is Erin and I say, Erin, I am so proud of you and those other people that are trying to teach children under these circumstances because I know what a challenge it is to be a teacher today anyway, and you throw what they're dealing with in on top of this, and, uh, and that's where we are. But we can do all things, what is it, Philippians 4.13? Philip, Brother Bob, 
Uh, you, you know, if, if God is on our side, and we hope that he is, and we uh, live like he is on our side, we can do all things. We can overcome these things and accomplish what his will nevertheless. I will, I will say something else, um, especially for those of you who are local. Our, one of our guys that uh, is one of our streamers, and, you know, that's a specialized job to be able to stream these things. He wound up sometime in the wee hours of the morning in an emergency trip to the hop, hospital at Chipolo. So George is having to tackle all this uh, kind of by himself and so you can imagine it's a challenge when you got all hands on deck but when you got one of your main guys uh, and, okay we are where we are George okay okay L let me go ahead and get uh, started then since we're a little bit behind I want to say very briefly something about uh, Bob Stansel uh, uh, he and his family live in uh, Sandy, Oregon, and he's the uh, uh, works with the congregation there in Sandy, Oregon. And I can't tell you how many years I'll let him do that if he wants to. He, that he's been working with this. I, I call it a traveling museum, but he makes it makes it uh, an opportunity for people to see things that they would never see unless they went to some museum in some big metropolitan area. So we appreciate, appreciate him. We appreciate uh, 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 his wife that uh, he has brought with him with, uh, I started to say Sandra, uh, Cheryl. Yeah. Well, Cheryl and his daughter, Erin, uh, who are with him and, and giving him support and only he knows how much support they are, and I'm sure they're a lot of support. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. We had the right person there to uh, give that introduction since we had technical difficulties that he spread out the introduction there. Joseph Stalin said that education was a weapon. And depending on who holds the power of being the educator uh, can do all kinds of things depending on who it's aimed at. He also made the statement that he said that they would exterminate Christianity from the Soviet Union by 1937. By 1940, when the Germans invaded, he was trying to support the churches and get them involved in trying to aid the people with refugees. So, you know, the uh, atheism that, uh, that they had embraced uh, there in the beginning, they were changing and backpedaling uh, for, for a time during that time period. So, what we want to look at here <clears throat> this morning is we're going to talk about the global flood and the evidences that we have, those things that have been unearthed. And we see before the flood, uh, if you do the math there in Genesis, that before the flood, people lived a lot longer than they do after the flood and a lot longer than we do today. There are those that would say that uh, uh, many deny that the flood ever existed. They say that there's not enough water upon the planet to, to flood the whole earth. And uh, we'll address that uh, momentarily. I have here, there was uh, an artifact that was discovered, and this is a replica, in 1922. And it's the Sumerian king list. And it has the list of kings that ruled before the flood. Their lifespans expand for quite a long time. 
their rules are quite a long time. Now, they're somewhat exaggerated from the biblical account, but at the same time, uh, there's some harmony. There is uh, one king list, one person on the king list, that was a king, and he is the uh, Sumerian version of the Noah character, and it, he's on that list there. So he was listed as a king, and uh, he could have well been a king in order to get the ark built. We don't know. But you can rely upon the dates there. If you look at the age that they lived and the age they had their firstborn, you can uh, come up with a conclusion there, and the math works out. And as we look then after the flood, uh, you have Noah, who lived 350 years, and then Seth, uh, who lived after that. And then as we begin to go down, we see that their descendants are living much shorter lives. They're dying before uh, those right after uh, the flood. And if you look at the red line there, uh, that's, that's right here, uh, Peleg's name means division. And it was at uh, that time that the languages were confused upon the earth. I took a course from uh, Leiden University in Sweden uh, online. And the thing I got out of the course, uh, the teacher said that all linguists agree that all human language originated from one language. They don't know what that language is or even if it still exists, but they can show that all human languages originated from one single language. And uh, so that's an important uh, thing to know because it uh, goes along with the biblical account here. And then you have uh, these other descendants. You have Terah, who is uh, Abraham's uh, father. And Abraham was 67 years old uh, when Noah died. Now, you wonder why wouldn't there be interaction here? Well, there. The languages are confused. They disperse across the earth, the Genesis account tells us. And what we want to look at today are some things that you have, may have never heard. And we want to look at the differences between a myth and a legend. A myth is something that is uh, unfounded or untrue. I worked with uh, individuals that say the, the Bible was nothing more than a myth. But to say that is to say Jesus Christ never lived, and uh, there are plenty of writers outside the Bible that confirm that Jesus Christ did live, and Roman writers that can confirm because of his followers. Uh, there's many other evidences that are, are in there, so the biblical facts uh, in the New Testament are very easy to confirm. And a lot of people, uh, 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 archaeologists, uh, scholars that are uh, anti-Bible want to classify and they teach Bible is uh, being silly and some of the things in the Bible as being silly. Yet archaeology, the evidence is there point towards and the validity thereof. A legend, on the other hand, is something that, uh, is, that actually happened. But as time progressed, you have, uh, well, we got way beyond where we wanted to be there. But as time progressed, uh, the stories became larger than life. And so what we want to do here is look at some evidences uh, that there was a global flood, that it was in fact one that covered the whole earth, and look at some of the uh, flood stories that exist that we can uh, glean some information from. So we already went through that. In the exhibit over there, we have uh, several cylinder seals, and what you see here is an impression from one of the seal cylinder seals, and these were <coughs> little uh, round 
cylinders. They had a hole. People would carry them around their neck, most likely. And they would use these to seal uh, documents, uh, uh, contracts, different things like that. Thousands of these are discovered that represent things that happened with the flood. And that, now these are personal cylinders, but yet they have images that have uh, things that just talk about the flood. In this particular one, here you have an image of a serpent or a dragon uh, that's being ridden uh, over uh, water. And as you look at that, uh, you have the sun god Marduk and uh, a dragon serpent, Tiamat, and uh, his name translated means chaos. And you will see that god throughout uh, many of these, uh, and, and many of the same characters. Marduk is uh, uh, sort of the Sumerian Babylonian name uh, for what the Canaanite god Baal was. And then you have Iana or Ishtar, uh, his consort. And so you have a lightning bolt and a water jug. And then there is a person that is E in Inke, which is the god that tries to save uh, mankind. And then you have the lion. Uh, the Mesopotamian world, the Assyrian. on this, uh, although there is no text there. That was found along uh, going further north uh, from the Persian Gulf. And here you have the sun god and dragon serpent. And you see that there's a reoccurring theme of these. And if you see the body here, it's oodulating uh, as if it's on waves. And then you see uh, uh, again, the dragon serpent, Chaos, and it was discovered at Susa. Susa is where Darius' palace was when Daniel uh, was under Darius. He was one of the three presidents. Uh, he was, uh, uh, they had the satraps, and then he was one of the three presidents. It was at Susa that he, he was put in the lion's den, and that's where that particular one was discovered. Then you have the uh, Chaldean Genesis tablet, and uh, I have that, and uh, that particular tablet has the parallels of the Genesis account here, and you have Utnapistam, who is Noah, and he came to build an ark, and then it goes how he builds it, and stocks it, and launches it, the storm is described, then there's a calm and the sending out of the birds. Uh, in this story, however, the, the birds are reversed from the Genesis account. 
and it is not the dove that comes back with the olive um, branch. Uh, he offers a sacrifice. That's the same as the biblical account. Uh, he and his wife in this account are granted immortality, uh, and it would seem so, uh, maybe by those that uh, he outlives so many generations, living 350 years after the flood. Uh, and he's basically, they're basically empty-handed and given a second chance at life. And I think I need help advancing this from George. Can we stop? There we go. That was found at Nineveh, uh, which is on uh, the tri Tigris there, and uh, it was destroyed by flood uh, from that river by one of the walls being collapsed uh, in a river flood, but it was a local flood in that instance. Then you have this particular one where you have uh, the storm god, and then again you have the e Inti god of the earth there. And what's nice about this one is you actually have lettering on it, and it can be translated. On the land fell a great calamity, one unknown to man that had never been seen before, which could not be withstood. A great storm from heaven, a land annihilating storm uh, there that you have in this one. And it's found in this area, and uh, I believe that's near modern day Aleppo, where they're having the problems, where they have the problems in Syria. Aleppo is a hundred miles from either the Mediterranean or from any of the major rivers. And it's uh, 1,500 feet above sea level. And there it talks about a storm. There it talks about a land annihilating storm. And we see that these are at different elevations. These are not local floods. They're all relating back to one flood. Another thing that come up at auction very often uh, that have been found in Mesopotamia are pairs of animals that are carved from rock. And they represent the animals that survived the flood. And they are in pairs of two. And uh, whether or not they were used by adults or by children uh, during that time, but they're, they're small, they're only about this big, and they come up in auction from time to time, uh, although I have not uh, gotten any of those. So you can see the five things that we looked at here and where they're spread out across the, the ancient uh, Medi uh, Middle East here. So here you've got the Mediterranean Sea coming down. Over here you've got the Persian Gulf. And these things are well spread up. These are five out of thousands that are scattered throughout uh, these places, Iraq, Iran. So now we want to talk about the epic of Gilgamesh. He is uh, on the Assyrian uh, king list. He is the king of uh, Erech or Ur. Uh, he is uh, the first king of Assyria. I have an image of him here. He is holding here a lion. And what we want to look at is uh, the epic of Gilgamesh. He searches out Utnapishtim. And if you recall, from looking at one of the earlier ones, Utnapishtim is Noah. And he goes to seek out Utnapishtim because he realizes that he is mortal. And his friend has died. And so he goes to seek how he can become uh, immortal. And uh, so he goes and gets the story from Utnapishtim, how he survived the flood. He asked him what uh, the, uh, what what allowed him to live so long, and Utnapishtim said it was a plant that is beneath the sea. And there are many things in the Epic of Gilgamesh that don't quite jive with the biblical account. The Ark is 120 by 120 cubits, uh, for instance. Uh, but you have to remember. There's a Tower of Babel here in the languages for the Jews. Now, we want to look at a person named in the biblical account that he is listed as the first king of Asher or Assyria and also the first king of establishing Babel or Babylon, Shinar, Ur, and 
let's look at Genesis chapter 10. And we see that uh, Ham has a son named Cush. And so we scroll down here and we see Cush's sons. And we see that he has uh, five sons at least there. But then he has uh, later a son named Cush. I mean, excuse me, Cush uh, named Nimrod. The Bible, each time Nimrod is mentioned, describes him as a mighty one in the earth, uh, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Whereas it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. The scripture points out that this Nimrod individual is a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, for the Holy Spirit, when we are in the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit statements like behold, it means to listen. You know, perk up your ears. The Holy Spirit says to someone, says, behold. And uh, you, that's, a, that's a, a time to listen particularly close to what the Spirit has to say. Here in the Old Testament, Nimrod is mentioned and always mentions that he is a mighty hunter. As we look at the image of Gilgamesh here, uh, could you say that his image looks like a mighty hunter? Certainly, he's holding a lion under his arm. And then it lists the kingdoms that he begins, and they are the same as the Yodhmer Shepherd. There is an Assyriologist who lived, and I think he died in 1933 or 1937, and uh, he was born in the 1800s, and he wrote a, a book, Religion of Babylon and Assyria. He translated many tablets at the British Museum. He uh, was self-taught in studying uh, Assyrian Canaanite and found out that they had mistranslated many parts of the Epic of Gilgamesh. In fact, it used to be named uh, the Epic of Idzibar. And he found out that they had uh, done many things in, in error. And so he was well-versed, well-studied, and he taught at different universities up there in London, worked at the British Museum. And he wrote this book. This book is available on iTunes. And when he studies the etymology here of uh, uh, Nimrod and Gilgamesh, uh, let's look here and, and see what uh, the conclusion is. I want to look at the Genesis account. I want to look at the Assyrian account, which is Gilgamesh account, and then we're going to look at the Greek legend of the flood. And I think some of the fonts here may have gotten larger than what they were originally uh, when they translated into this version of PowerPoint. So we have Noah there in Genesis, and he lived 350 years after the flood. And he So when he is deified, uh, Pinchas 
says that his name became Merodach. Now here's where it gets interesting. Merodach in Assyrian means rebellion. Nimrod in Genesis means rebellion. It, Merodach is mentioned in uh, Jeremiah and the Babylonian version of Merodach is Marduk. It's the same thing. The Canaanite version of the god is Baal. So it could be that Nimrod became worshipped as Baal. He was a mighty one upon the earth. So people took note of him. He established uh, three kingdoms at least that remained uh, throughout the ancient world. Now let's take a look at the Greek legend very quickly. And it's derived of two words, two Greek words, his name there in the Greek, as you see. And the first word means sweet new wine. What did Noah do when he, he, he planted a vineyard, didn't he? And then the second half of his name means sailor, seaman, or fisherman. The Greek version of Marduk is Zeus. And so uh, that's again, that one's on page seven of the uh, book that Pinches wrote, which you can get off iTunes and have a copy of if you'd like that. It's free. Probably never heard this, have you? And uh, you kind of got to dig down and find these things. But there have been people that have studied this and have come to the conclusion. And I've had people afterwards come up and say, do you really think Gilgamesh was uh, Nimrod? I've, I do. I believe that. I believe that the epic of Gilgamesh is a legend that got distorted because of the language being distorted of Babel. And I think uh, personally that it's a good possibility that Nimrod did search out Noah and got the, the, the facts wrong. I think that Nimrod was maybe probably not a righteous man in God's eyes, but he was a mighty hunter. Uh, and Josephus wrote that you could see the remains of the ark during his day. And that was in 94 AD that he wrote this. He wasn't writing this to try to get people to go look at them. He was writing uh, this little snippet is from, he's talking about a queen and her son that helped the Jews during the famine. In fact, the very same famine that Paul was bringing money back for the church that he gathered from Corinth and uh, Macedonia that he would, and he brought back. It's the flood or famine that Agabus had predicted and it was severe. And this queen and her son became uh, Jewish proselytes. And in fact, her tomb is on the Mount of Olives. She's buried there. And their kingdom is where present day Armenia is. There is a curator at the British Museum named Irving Finkel. And he says in all of his research and studies and the uh, cuneiform writings that he's read that the ark rested on the south southeast side of Turkey. The people that claim that they've discovered the ark today of all, uh, I, let me back up, I said Turkey, south southeast side in Armenia. And that's what the ancient records point to and also Josephus. Today, people are looking in the Turkey side and they're claiming that they found, discovered the ark there, but it contradicts what the ancient records say and they could go up and see it according to Josephus. The Gilgamesh epic, the ark is a box. It's 120 by 120 by 120 cubits. Uh, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to take a cruise in something shaped like that. Uh, why would he get it wrong? Tower of Babel, possibly. Noah's Ark, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. Perfect ratio for high seas. World War II Liberty ships, almost the same uh, specs as the Ark. It's nearly the same length, same height, 
uh, it's a little more narrow, it's 57 feet uh, instead of the 75 feet. These were extremely slow ships, but they were extremely seaworthy ships. There is one in San Francisco, SS Jeremiah O'Brien. It was used in the movie Titanic uh, to uh, reenact the striking of the iceberg. They took it out, ran as, a, as fast as it would go, and they didn't go that fast. And then they ran the engines backwards to simulate uh, the shaking there that, that you saw. On ships today, you have a line that goes across here that shows you how much weight is on the ship and it tells you, you know, where not to overload the ship, you know, how not to overload the ship. That was developed in the 1800s by a man named Samuel Plimsoll. And he lived uh, on those dates. He was uh, one of the uh, British Admiralty uh, House of Lords. He came up with a basic formula because they were losing ships at sea. And what was happening, they were overloading the ships, so they said, you know, we, we need to figure out how not to overload our ships. So he came up with a basic formula, and that basic formula was one half the height of the ship, not including the mast, but one half the height of the ship. Uh, if you look at uh, that there, and let's go to Genesis chapter six, and we see that the uh, waters prevailed uh, faced over the face of the earth and uh, the waters under the whole heaven and it says there in verse 20 and 15 cubits did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered the ark is 30 cubits so where would the plimsoll line of the ark be 15 cubits the math for the plimsoll line is there in Genesis chapter six. Mo, or excuse me, Noah was told to take the ark and pitch it inside and out. Ancient ships that they find don't use this. They use a technique and it is a mortise pegged and tenon design these things are used using wooden pegs and put together, not nails. And they rely upon being set out into the water and the wood swells and makes them watertight. Ancient ships weren't pitched and tarred, but Noah was told to pitch and tar the ship, um, not just rely upon the swelling of the wood. Uh, that is something that is more advanced than the typical ships there that you, that you find. If you go out on the internet, if your kids are going out on the internet, they're gonna see that there are people out there that say uh, it's impossible. There's just not enough water uh, in these things. And the Holy Spirit knew that these people would come. And they would say that since the beginning, all things have you know, been the same. Where is the sign of his coming? And he says that they willfully forget that the earth of old being in water and out of water perished. The earth was different prior to the flood. We don't know how that is. We know that it had some type, of, it was in water and out of water. We find that there are tropical plants down at both uh, and north and south poles. Uh, it was a different earth. The earth that now exists is prepared with fire. Uh, what spews out of the ground out of the mountains? Lava, right? What spewed out of the ground, does the Bible say, what spewed out of the ground during the flood? The rain, the water came down from heavens, but also came up from the mountains, it burst forth. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. We need to help our younger generations understand because they are being beaten down, beaten down, beaten down. Joseph Goebbels, Nazi propaganda minister, says if you teach someone a lie, 
and tell it to them enough times that they will not believe the truth when it is told to them. And that's, what they, that's the way they worked. Uh, the internet can be very good or it can be very bad. And I know members in the church that are reading things off the internet and taking them as being true and they are just as false as can be. It, they're mythology. I saw a bulletin where a man wrote about ancient Baal. And he said, Baal had the head of a bull. Well, if you go on the internet, there's a lot of images, but they're usually copied from the same in, image. And they portray Baal as a head with uh, having a bull's head. But if you look at all the artifacts that have been found, he does not have a bull's head. That came from someone's imagination. And he wrote a great article, but you could tell he looked on the internet to get his information, what Baal looked like, rather than looking at the actual artifacts. And Baal did not, and so you would say, well, that's just a little mistake. But if we keep making little mistakes, our our kids, the next generations, are not going to know the truth. On a side note, this is something that I looked up, and this is, I, I like Google Maps, and having Google Maps, you can learn a lot of things and do a lot of exploring. But we went to Mesa Verde with our children some years ago, and at Mesa Verde there in Colorado, um, there in the museum, they have all of these seagoing animals, their bones, you have shark's teeth, whale bones, all types of saltwater sea animals there. And they discovered these as they were finding artifacts of the Anastasi Indians. So what they said at the museum was the Anastasi Indian, Indians put their pick the, the place to put the refuse just where there was a big deposit of fossils of these sea creatures and that the sea creatures lived millions of years prior and they just happened to put their trash pit on top of it. Not that they could have been eating sea creatures. If you look at this area, uh, you know, if you go to a river that's, uh, when it goes high and low, uh, you'll see things like this as it goes by. This is a very narrow canyon. The scientists there say that they moved upwards and climbed ladders to get up to the top to get away from their enemies. Not a single bead has been found or arrowhead of any enemy that these people had. Not a single one. But why would they have to go up and hide if they were the more uh, uh, prominent people, if they were the more advanced culture. Now from the top here, there are some very easy trails that come down and get you there, and you use those today. Now this is another uh, cliff dwelling. And can you really tell me that people would climb all the way up here to get away from, from the threats of danger and make their houses up here? I think it would be kind of a, a pain, don't you? Now. One thing you can do on Google Maps is you can look at your altitudes. And if you look at cliff dwellings from New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, one thing that you notice there, what's their elevation? Are they far apart from each other or are they pretty close to each other? They're pretty close. In my mind, I would suggest to you that when the flood occurred in the Western Americas, there was a lot of water retained inland when the waters receded. And then at some point, all of that burst and went through and could have created the Grand Canyon. The Grand, Grand Canyon at the southern end is higher than it is at the north end. But a large amount of water coming through very quickly could make a very big difference in just a matter of hours and create such a, a canyon. If you look at the Google Maps and you look at, the, uh, look at it from the space here, 
when I was a kid, and then of course you got the San Joaquin Valley. When I was a kid, I used to live on a farm and we did row irrigation. And so my dad would wait for the waters to come and he would sleep in the pickup and I'd go out and I'd make little dams between the furrows trying to halt the water. And when the dam, uh, the water came and would finally overflow and break down the dam and flunt, come through very quickly, you would get these kind of little ridges there because uh, it would, the way it would flow out. Now suppose that this area all flowed out at once. You know, isn't there a, a story in uh, Greek mythology, and they don't know if it's true or not, but isn't there a Greek city that was buried by water because the water elevations raised very quickly and the city of Atlantis was lost? The water levels have changed since ancient times, and we know that. And uh, you know, this amount of water might change the sea level a bit. Uh, it's a possibility. I suggest to you that the Ind Anastasia Indians were coming, they were living up above on the, the Verdes, and they were working their way down as the sea levels dropped there in that inland America area because they, don't, they didn't have altimeters to make all of their dwellings the same elevation, did they? Something kept them at that same elevation. Well, the only thing that you can think of is water, right? And uh, so this is one of the oldest ancient ships that, that we know of. The, they didn't find the ship, but what they found was the relief of the ship. And they built a replica, and they tried to take it out onto the Mediterranean Sea, and it's, it's really not seaworthy. Uh, actually, Egyptians didn't make very good boats. They, they were not good seamen. They were good riverboat people. And in fact, they didn't know how to sail into the wind. Oops, I did something there. And they didn't know how to sail into the wind because the dial flowed one direction and they went, uh, flowed with the current with their sails down. And then when they went back the other way, they put the sails up and then uh, went back very easily. And uh, that ship, it's believed that they held it together with rope. That's approximately uh, just after the flood, that relief there. Compare that to Noah's Ark. There was not a ship built the size of Noah's Ark until uh, just right after the Civil War, and it was called the Great Eastern. The company that built the ship to bring cargo back and forth uh, across the Atlantic went out of business because they couldn't fill it because it was so big. Now, of course, today we have more commerce going across, and there are ships, of course, that are bigger than Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark could, was very capable and capable of handling all of those things. So uh, it's a perfect seagoing ratio. It was built to the Plimsoll line uh, here is in the scriptures that you can see the ratio of how where it would be loaded to. And these things here, uh, God has given us. We don't live in the age of miracles that they did in the first century. We don't see people being raised from the dead to confirm that the scriptures are true that are being taught because we have the scriptures in their complete form in the Bible. But today, we have something as powerful as miracles, and that is evidences that confirm the biblical accounts. And we have an exhibit over here that just hits the tip of the iceberg of those evidences. So we need to let our kids know. And unfortunately, we don't have a, a lot of kids here for these things. And uh, I find that in, in just about everywhere I go. And uh, have we grown dull of hearing? Um, uh, you know, many things to talk about about Melchizedek, but because of the dullness of their hearing, people got tired of hearing. And I'm afraid that people are getting tired of hearing about the Word of God, and I hope that's not be the case. And I'm glad you're here today to hear this and take some of this home. And uh, hopefully it has encouraged you uh, 
uh, in your faith in the Bible. Thank you.